So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, we know that we have participants coming to us today from across the world, and we are delighted that you've been able to join us for what we hope is going to be an informative and collaborative workshop. Um, my name is Catherine Bailey. I'm Head of Communications with Godan, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Um, we also have our Chief Scientist, Sushit Anand, who will be um, behind the scenes asking questions, help, helping to expand any questions that you ask to the panel. Um, so if he gets in touch with you, then please don't be alarmed. He is part of our team for today. Um, you can see that we have put up on the screen for you our agenda for today. Um, we will be having a series of short interventions that will hopefully give you some background into the work, the collaborative work that we have been doing into data rights and the agricultural data codes of conduct toolkit, which we'll also be demonstrating to you. Um, we will also then have a chance for you to share and direct questions to the panel. So on that note, if you have any questions that you would like to ask to direct to, um, specific panel members or to the panel as a whole and please put those in the comments we'll get to those they'll help us to inform our discussion later on um, and if there's any that are relevant we will we'll be coming to those um, as and when the um, situation arises so first of all you can see if i take you back to our agenda that we have an introduction to data ethics in agriculture by our very own Fatini Zampati, data rights expert at Godam. So um, if you are ready, Fatini, then I will pass over to, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass over to you. Um, a little bit of introduction uh, around data ethics in agriculture. So basically uh, the most common, I would say, ethical issues around data in agriculture is the uncertainty around data ownership and actually who really uh, controls or has access and use of data. And this is something that it's not really um, recognized in um, legislation worldwide. There are also issues around uh, privacy, around personal data. Um, these are basically concerns that coming from farmers, um, what uh, data should be considered personal or not in agriculture. Uh, this is a, uh, a basic issue um, around this um, ownership or control and access of data. Uh, so there are also issues around security, there is a lack of trust, lack of transparency. Uh, in many cases, farmers are not really aware about their rights, um, about their rights to access to their data or their rights to information, their rights to, to portability. So there is an issue uh, here. And uh, of course, there is a lack of awareness and um, a lack of uh, when they do give consent or not when uh, someone is going to ask for their data. Uh, there is also another issue uh, around the lack of benefit sharing um, between farmers and agribusinesses. And in many cases, as mentioned, farmers uh, are not really aware of the value of benefit sharing. That's also uh, an issue in the agricultural sector. Uh, this leads to data symmetries, to power and knowledge imbalances between the stakeholders um, because of the limited access of some farmers to digital technologies or to the data that uh, they generate, as mentioned. And this is the well-known digital divide. There is also a risk of misuse of farmers' data. There are monopolies because we do know that whoever really controls data has the power over data. And as mentioned, uh, worldwide and currently, there is no uh, legislation that really deals with uh, farm data around its property. The rights that do exist uh, around it is uh, around personal privacy, confidential information, copyright licenses, database rights. Uh, but basically, the question uh, always that troubles us, I would say, is 
who really exercise uh, the right, the person about whom data pertains, the person who provided the data, the entity that made investments in the collection. Uh, we are talking about a value chain, so its segment needs to be taken into consideration, I would say. And again, there is no clear framework, uh, legal framework from uh, farm data sharing. Um, so one way of dealing uh, these issues is to um, promote and enhance more uh, the idea of codes of conduct and why codes of conduct, someone might ask, uh, because they help build trust between the stakeholders that they do engage into the discussions about uh, the codes of conduct when they are dealing with uh, a contract, uh, because they cover somehow these normative gaps uh, meaning that industry-led self-regulation in the form of codes of conduct or voluntary guidelines can have a role in filling, as mentioned, the legislative void and setting, most important, I would say, common standards for farm data sharing contracts, even across countries and regions. Another way um, is that they do simplify the assessment of behaviors, like in other sectors when companies want to demonstrate compliance with social responsibility requirements. And there is also this form of accreditation that they could provide. And another issue that it's very, very important, if you ask me, is that they do build and raise um, awareness because they do change the way agribusiness think about data and make uh, mostly data producers, primarily farmers, more aware of their rights. And another thing that it is important is the participation and inclu inclusiveness, because when we are talking developing codes of conduct, um, then more and more um, people engage, more and more stakeholders are engaged into the discussions, and this really fosters trust and increases credibility. And uh, of course, farmers and agribusinesses are more than willing to share their data with each other. Uh, if they do engage uh, into this open mindset, they do know what are the benefits, they do know what are the risks, uh, and in that way, trust can be a more um, enhanced. Uh, so worldwide, they are four, I will just mention them very, very quickly. Um, there are four um, codes of conduct, conduct that they are dealing with uh, farm data sharing. Uh, we have the EU Code of Conduct on Agricultural Data um, Sharing Agreement by Contractual Agreement in 2018. We have the American Farm Bureau Federation Privacy and Security uh, Principles. We have also the New Zealand Farm Data Code of Practice. And very, very recently, in this year, uh, in 2020, we have the Australian Farm Data Code. Um, this shows the need to enhance trust, transparency, when uh, different stakeholders interact within these um, um, agreements, the contracts, uh, there's need to make these contracts more um, simple. And uh, hence, uh, they have emerged these codes of conduct. And of course, um, these, the above mentioned codes have a certification scheme. Actually, uh, the three of them, only the EU code of conduct doesn't really have um, a certification scheme, has only a checklist. Uh, where agribusinesses uh, just go and consult uh, 10 simple questions, but the other codes of conduct have developed certification schemes from um, uh, by independent authorities. We will mention them um, during the, the workshop. Uh, I just need to do only um, a quick introduction about the codes of conduct. So these codes of conduct, uh, the existing ones, uh, cover central issues such as terminology, data ownership, who owns data, who can access, who can control this um, data, data rights, uh, the right to access, data portability, the right to be forgotten, privacy issues that most of the times uh, are dealt with this contract or should be dealt in more um, attention, I would say. Um, there is the issue of consent, disclosure and transparency. And of course, as mentioned, they attempt to harness the benefits of agricultural data while protecting producers' privacy and security. Uh, I need to mention at this point that these codes of conduct are not legally binding, uh, so they rely on self-regulation, on the goodwill of the partners that are engaged. Uh, but still, but still, these codes raise awareness. Uh, they contribute to transparency in the agricultural data flows. And most importantly, I would say is that they do change the way agribusinesses um, 
think about how they um, handle da uh, data. And of course, farmers, from their point of view, are more aware of their um, rights. Um, of course, uh, codes of conduct, it's not only, you know, uh, has not, uh, have not really uh, and only strengths. Um, every coin has two sides. So we do need to take into account some challenges, uh, challenges that they might possibly overlap and conflict with existing uh, legislation, such as privacy laws or consumer laws. Um, another big question is, who is in the best position to design, implement and administer these codes of conduct? Um, do we have adequate adoption and enforcement? Um, what about credibility? And there is also, also the risk of watering down the, the principles. But as mentioned, the good part of these codes of conduct is that they um, do enhance effectiveness, adoption, there is balance uh, between attraction and high standards, um, they enhance credibility, trust, transparency. Um, the farmer's perspective is uh, more um, uh, taken into account, I would say. Uh, there uh, is uh, more an open discussion around farm data sharing. Um, and this is pretty much um, what really codes of conduct in agriculture um, are about. And of course, we will, uh, following, uh, discuss a little bit based on the codes of conduct that I quickly uh, mentioned to you, how we decided as Godan, CTA and GFAR uh, to work more on this uh, toolkit on codes of conduct in, uh, in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you for Fatini for that very informative presentation. Um, we'll now go to the creation and development of the agricultural data codes of conduct. Um, so it's going to be a short 15 minutes, um, well, several presentations. Um, and on the panel for this intervention, we have Chris Addison, who was involved in Godan's data ethic work from the start um, and involved in the creation of this tool um, while in his post as senior program coordinator at the CTA. Um, he is now a digital development consultant for communique.org. Um, we also have Valeria Persky, um, who is a consultant information management specialist um, and is representing GFAR's work. Um, Valeria is also a longtime contributor to Godan's research, as she was also heavily involved with the Godan Action Research Project, um, and our own Fortini Zampati data rights expert as well. If I can pass over to you. Yes. Uh... So let me share my screen again. And discuss about the toolkit that Kate mentioned to you. So um, what is and the background of the development of this online uh, tool? So the question is um, how this online tool was developed, what really offers, um, who contributed to the development of this tool, what its person, uh, purpose, to whom it is addressed. These are the basic um, questions. So um, in July uh, 2018, uh, Godan, CTA and uh, GFAR convened an expert consultation uh, on ethical, legal and policy aspects of data sharing affecting farmers. The idea was of a collecting action on empowering farmers through equitable data sharing. And as part of this collective uh, action, um, these uh, three organizations decided to focus on developing better data management practices through the adoption and implementation of agricultural dates, uh, data codes of conduct, voluntary guidelines and principles. 
So the question is, and I would say it's a very reasonable question, is what this online tool really offers. This online tool aims to describe the shared responsibility of many actors, addresses the need for a cooperative effort, recognizes the need for capacity strengthening for its implementation, and describes the standards of conduct for fairer and more responsible data management, complementing, of course, the existing legally binding uh, instruments. Um, so who were these people who contributed to the development of this tool? Um, as mentioned, this online tool was developed by Godin CTA and uh, GFAR in joint collaboration. And uh, it is produced in the context of uh, a data, uh, um, a Godin, sorry, CTA subgroup, subgroup on data codes of conduct. Uh, so what the subgroup really did is, was, sorry, to review the existing codes of conduct, the one that I've mentioned to you earlier, um, the EU code of conduct, the um, uh, New Zealand and the USA code of conduct, the Australian is very, very recent. And so what we did is that we combined these codes of conduct. We try to find the commonalities, the differences between the existing ones. And then we worked on um, finding and recommending the essential aspects and points for a general scalable and further customizable code of conduct template that really best addresses the needs of the farmer. And then uh, the initial draft of this work was circulated uh, to a workshop that we did last year at um, Katie Bell. Uh, we had continuous consultation with different stakeholders and everything we got, we incorporated into this edition that we are going to show you furthermore. The purpose of this online tool is to provide actually a guide to best data management practice to farmers, but not only to farmers, but to agribusinesses and associations who really collect, manage, and share their data. But it, ha it has also a further practical purpose to provide the conceptual basis for general scalable guidelines for everyone dealing with the production, ownership, sharing, and use of data in agriculture. These guidelines help you produce a guidance list to consider when sharing or collecting agricultural data with partners. So another question would be why now? Why now has been developed this um, online toolkit? Uh, well, as mentioned earlier, uh, this online toolkit kit came, I would say, on time because there is no legal framework for farm data sharing. While laws and regulations that govern personal data, like the general uh, data protection regulation, are becoming increasingly com common because they are about, you know, it is about personal data, uh, there is lack of legislation covering the collection, sharing, and use of data in agriculture. Uh, as mentioned, there is a lack of transparency around issues of data ownership, um, about data rights, privacy, security, uh, whether farm data should be considered personal or not. So since uh, all these issues are governed by contracts and licensing um, agreements, which are very complex, uh, there was this need, I would say, to work more on the codes of conduct and create this tool to better address these issues, to provide some kind of, uh, I would say, solutions when the different stakeholders um, interact uh, one another with these contracts, but they should have something, some guidelines uh, as, as, as a guidance. Um, and as mentioned to whom it is addressed, I just mentioned right now, uh, everyone who really is engaged in the agricultural sector, uh, from the private sector, governments, farmers, farmers associations, researchers, civil society, all these uh, could really uh, consult this toolkit uh, when they are um, dealing with one another and having, as mentioned, some principles to work on because these issues, as mentioned, around privacy or ownership or access um, are not so clear. So this tool really provides uh, these guidelines. Uh, in May, we launched the toolkit 
after uh, publishing uh, a working paper on the review of the existing codes of conduct, after working, as mentioned, within the subgroup on codes of conduct and with consultation with different stakeholders. And the scope and the idea basically is to create um, a general scalable and customizable code of conduct, uh, conduct template that addresses the needs of all actors in the agricultural data ecosystem. I mean, uh, if we have a researcher or a farmer or a farmer, uh, farmer association, uh, they can uh, go to this toolkit and uh, they can select from the tool features clauses that we uh, have um, developed. There are 17 uh, um, features which are relevant and they can proceed to check out, select uh, the clauses that they consider it's they are more um, relevant to, uh, to them. And then uh, these clauses can be used as an output to um, a document. Here are the 17 clauses that we have concluded uh, to be uh, into this toolkit. Uh, it is uh, around definitions, ability to control and access, consent, you, uh, we will uh, further uh, mention them. And we need to mention at this point that these clauses uh, are not intended to be exhaustive and they are no subject for a robust institutional framework to guide and operationalize decision-making concerning privacy and ethics. It's, it's a guide, it's an involving tool uh, with recommendations and any feedback is more than welcome uh, to this uh, point to, um, make it even better because we might have missed something, we might have overlooked uh, something. So if you really are interested in knowing more, uh, please join us uh, to our data rights and responsible data working group. And of course, our subgroup on codes of uh, conduct. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fatini. I believe Chris is up next um, with more background into the creation of the toolkit. Thank you very much, Katrine. Um, so I wanted to step back a bit. Um, as Fatini said, I was involved sort of at the beginning of this journey with GFAR, looking at how we could support the idea of developing codes of conduct. So why do we need to share data? Um, we're facing some pretty serious threats right now in terms of climate change, in terms of hunger, exacerbated by our most recent threat, COVID-19. And the way we've dealt with these kind of issues is to start sharing data in a really open way. And that's really accelerated the research that's gone ahead with COVID-19, it put us in a position to act more readily because the information was available. But addressing food security, particularly hunger, is a long-standing issue. We've been collecting data on this since 6,000 years ago in Babylonia, where the first census was run. We're still collecting the information on tablets. So Last year in Iraq, the census was done on a tablet, but the way that information is stored makes a completely different dynamic. Whilst we're looking in ancient times, again, about 500, uh, um, sorry, about 300 years before the Christian era, we had the Library of Alexandria. Researchers then, and those people studying and wanting to use data, had to physically be in that place. We saw that there were security issues in terms of the great fire there destroyed so much knowledge. Now we're in the luxury of being able to store all this information digitally. And we still collect it in different places around the world. We still have different data centers. This small image from aginfra.eu shows the distribution of some of the main agricultural data centers around the world. And we also have some pooled data spread across, for example, Google Earth, where there's 20 petabytes of data. Now that's the equivalent of enough storage to be playing mu music um, at least half a day 
for the last 6,000 years. So that is a massive amount to imagine how much storage we've got and how much data is involved. And this kind of data exchange obviously originally was very much focused on a government census and the farmer providing that information. And that census then being made for decision making on how food security could be uh, achieved. We've added to that mix all the digital information we have from sensors, from drones, from remote sensing, from apps. And that's being provided and used now by other players such as the solution providers who are providing weather forecasts on mobile phones or agricultural extension. It's been used in the agribusiness and retail sectors for running their business. And it's been used by the researchers to tackle some of those issues around crop protection, pest control and other, other parts. But this needs to be a dynamic system where that information is then fed back into a pool and this is kind of managed at a national level to inform government. And this is what's happening across the world in terms of the creation of a kind of digital ecosystem in countries and regions. This central store or exchange of data needs some form of governance. It needs enabling in terms of investments. It needs development of skills and it needs those incentives and enabling policies to encourage this kind of exchange and these opportunities. And the first three of these are, for example, written into the European Union data strategy. And they've chosen to adopt that for two issues, health and agriculture. So obviously, if this exchange is going on, we need to address the data rights issue, which is why we came to this discussion on codes of conduct, ownership, access, transparency, control, portability, privacy, security. Uh, represented in those 17 clauses that uh, Fatani just mentioned. The platform on which this exchange happens means a fair bit of wrangling, those negotiations, those fixes to make sure data is standardized, that it fits in, that it can be brought into uh, a central exchange, um, the collection process and processing, and the rules on that exchange, the interfaces for providing APIs, for example, to allow solutions, all these need agreement and control, which stems from the codes of conduct. It's important to evaluate the process and to provide an opportunity for innovation with the data that's available. In adopting this, we're still trying to work towards those sustainable development goals. The UN in their recent study on digitalization really emphasized this. And there are some digital principles developed by those who are helping to support the transition digitalization of agriculture, designing for user, designing for scale, taking into account the existing digital ecosystem, looking at the same sustainability and business models with social impact, being data driven, being open in both the data and the software used so that these elements can be reused and being collaborative, working in partnership. In building these systems is also to, import, uh, to remember what data you actually need to solve the key problems. So doing a survey, not just fitting uh, what's available, but trying to plug some of those gaps, taking use cases on what data needs to be collected, why, for what purpose, and for whose benefit, and looking at supporting those stakeholder views. Driving the food system are the consumer and the investor. So there are opportunities here for them to be able to exchange data and groups representing those areas also to exchange data. Now, when you look at the perspectives of the different people, I don't want to go into detail here, but these are the kind of priorities that came out of a, the workshop that uh, GFAR, CTA and, and uh, KTBL uh, ran with a group of farmers, group of researchers, group of governments, where the farmers come up with ownership of the data as being the key, the researchers come up with the clarification, the metadata and source descriptions, and the governments are interested in the way the contracts are drawn up with clear definitions. So we thought the code of conduct gives people an opportunity to really see from those different perspectives what the priorities are in terms of their own codes of conduct. And that's why we put the toolkit together. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris, for that really very clear explanation as to why we need such a tool.
Um, I believe Valeria has a few words to say um, from her perspective as having worked um, with GFAR on this tool. Yes, thank you, Kate. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Thanks for being uh, at this webinar. Uh, as Fotini, okay, Fotini and Chris already introduced uh, the reasons why we uh, we worked on this toolkit, how we started working together on uh, on this idea of a collective action, how we have a working group in Godan where we have worked together on legal and ethical issues related to farm data sharing. So I'm not going to add much on uh, you know, the overall process. And then uh, you will also see a demonstration which will make it much clearer. We, it will make clear what the objective was and what we wanted to achieve. I will just give a very quick overview of what uh, the perspective of GFAR was in this work, why we participated and what we think that the next steps could be. Although of course this webinar and discussion with the participants is also about understanding what the next steps should be. Um, very, few, very few words on, on what GFAR is, the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation. Uh, it, it's a global forum, so it's a, it's a neutral platform for discussion, for consultations, and it brings together partners from all sectors. Uh, small order farmers are actually the, 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 the stakeholders that are at the center of our vision of agricultural innovation. And the way we work, the way GFAR works, is through co uh, consultative processes, and in particular through collective actions. So collective actions are multi-stakeholder programs of work that can be established at national, regional, and international level. They, have, they are initiated and, let's say, led by three or more partners, so they are already collaborative in, in nature. And then they they of course welcome more partners and are facilitated by the global forum. Uh, the, the, the way that the actions should work is that the partners in the action commit to, to work on a certain thing, to provide resources in kind and to generate and raise uh, funds together. And what happened in 2017-18, uh, as already Fotini and Chris mentioned, is that several partners in GFAR agreed that digital agriculture and farm data sharing was something that presented both opportunity, opportunities and challenges. And that was something that called for, for collective action. So that was a period when we were collecting um, feedback and uh, let's say the demand of our stakeholders. And this was, was one area that was identified as an area where collective action would make sense. Um, I, I will go very quickly through this because we already know uh, what we all expect from data-driven agriculture in terms of in, improving productivity, being able to mitigate, mitigate the effects of climate change, a more efficient use of natural resources, improving resilience in farming, and of course, uh, one of the primary uh, benefits uh, is um, making agri-food value chains more efficient and transparent. But we all know that the, 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 there's a big issue in how much small order farmers are benefiting from this. And of course, if, if small order farmers don't benefit from data-driven agriculture, culture share their data and to participate in the, the whole data value chain. Uh, also the, 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 the whole the benefits of digital agriculture to the value chains will be will be missed. This was this was the idea, the, let's say the, the, the reason why GIFAR started working on these things. And in 2018 we had this consultation with GIFAR with Godan and CTA. Uh, what I'm highlighting here is some is to go to the theme of the, 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 the code of conduct uh, toolkit that we are presenting today. In, in the vision document we produced in this uh, consultation, there are two sentences that in a way explain why the work on this toolkit is important to us. Uh, in the core of our vision is that we have to promote inclusive data ecosystems that nurture equitable sharing. And equitable sharing means that all participants equally benefit from the data sharing. And we focused in this vision document on uh, go uh, governance models that are based on negotiation and transparency. And we make examples of self-regulating self -regulating governance models like voluntary guidelines, protocols, and codes of conduct. So to us, the, the development of this tool is in line with the vision document that we produced in this uh, consultation. Uh, I will not go into the details of all the reasoning behind this, but the core of uh, of the idea behind the codes of conduct is that they promote trust, 
was in the end uh, after the discussions, the consultation, the vision document, we found that everything came down to trust. Uh, what, what the codes of conduct do in terms of uh, facilitating trust is they, they clarify a lot of, they can clarify, of course, they are, they are a tool, they have to be used and uh, then, uh, let's say, customized. But they clarify a lot of aspects of the sharing of data that help all the parties to uh, have more trust in the sharing of data. So, for instance, to whom does the data belong at each stage, you know, in the whole value chain and going from the farmer to the other steps, to the other uh yeah steps in the value chain who decides on sharing the data or not sharing who decides on the conditions for sharing the data uh what is the legal framework what is not in the legal framework as we saw there is not there isn't much in the legal framework and what can the codes of conduct uh do to fill uh, these, these gaps in the legal framework so for us the, the toolkit is really a coherent output of this consultation that we had it encourages governance models based on negotiation and transparency it's, in, it's an example also of the key outputs that we put in this vision document we we started thinking of what we could produce out of a collective action and the ideas were all around an inventory of current policies codes contractual practices synthesize, synthesizing uh, this material and translating into some knowledge that was usable creating a toolkit for farmers and uh, working on voluntary guidelines and certifications. So, so this toolkit for us is, a, is really a step in this direction. And of course, it's, a, it's also based on this review that we conducted together, so on this existing course of conduct. Last slide is on the next steps. Uh, of course, the discussion today will be about this. For us, uh, the most important part, as it is already written on the website, it's consultations, consultations and, and adaptations of, of this work. Of course, the work that has been done so far is based on 17 general clauses. Uh, these clauses are not, of course, suitable for all contexts. So working on local contexts, getting feedback from farmers organizations, for instance, on the next steps on what is what would be useful to make this tool really useful uh, for them. Examples are variations of clauses. These clauses that we put there are taken from the existing uh, codes of conduct. Uh, they can be, of course, transformed and adapted to, to local context and local situ situations, translations, uh, and work on the success factors. Potini in her presentation uh, listed the, the success factors that we, uh, that let's say, were identified in this paper, this review of codes of conduct that we prepared and uh, so work on the effectiveness of these codes, the adoption level, if they're not adopted, they're, they're useless, uh, the balance between the attraction for the people who have to become members, let's say, or adhere to these codes of conduct and the high standards that, that need to be maintained, credibility of the code, uh, representation and inclusiveness, which is key for FIFAR. So the farmer's perspective must be in these codes and there is a lot to be done for that because they were not, be, they were not written by farmers. Um, so these are the, for us the, the, the next steps, and we hope that uh, part of this work can be done in the collective action, which we, that we want to, I mean, we want to resume. We started already some time ago. Uh, now we want to resume with a more formal collective action. We have partners like Foragro and the World, Food, World Farmers Organization that have uh, already proposed a couple of collective actions, and we want to revive the collaboration among all the people who participated in the consultation and signed the, the vision document and of course invite new partners so we will start working on this and uh, contact uh, people and look for for partners in this collective action thank you very much thank you valeria for a very instructive presentation um we have a question from john mundy that i think might be a good idea to bring up at this point um, so if I just ask it to the panelists and see if you have any thoughts on it. Um, John is saying that many data systems are not sufficiently financed to manage data ethically or sufficiently to support integrations. He's wondering if there is any guidance on optimum resourcing for structuring optimal and ethical data exchanges. And what would the guidance be on the nature of capacity or personnel required? and the ways within which capacity building efforts could align with data toolkit best practices. Chris, do you want to go? 
Yes, uh, perhaps I can say a little bit. I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to get the Code of Conduct together was to really have some of the discussions, um, particularly with those data organizations that were looking at managing the data and were running into these ethical issues and discover what was what was realistic in terms of the agreements. Um, so I think overall, we just have to step back a bit and think about how expensive it is if you don't take that ethical approach. So if you think about Facebook, when they had the big scandal with Cambridge Analytica, um, they lost uh, trust to the extent of about 50% of the trust level they were at before. And the highest trending thing was to leave Facebook. And Facebook's stock dropped 20% at that stage. They were also fined $5 billion by the Federal Trade Commission. So with the big players, this is really a serious concern to think about the impact of these issues. But also one of the reasons this is a voluntary code is to look at some of the environments where it's going to be more um, difficult to enforce different levels. And for certain types of data, it needs to be clear that the, uh, the controls are, are at different levels. So you're quite right that some of the issues such as saying that um, data has to be deleted or some of the portability issues, these are gonna have costs associated with them which can really cripple some of the smaller applications developers and startups. So there's definitely a balance there. But in terms of absolute costs, I haven't seen uh, actual implementations costed here. Um, I've had some rough guidance on the relative costs of the different elements, but I think this is really why we want to create this group and get this kind of discussion going. And if other people on the call have key examples, perhaps they can place those in the chat as well. Thanks, Valeria. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think we should, given the time at the moment, move on to um, having a quick look through the tool itself. Um, so Fatini is going to guide us through that. Um, I will just open the tool on the screen and then we can look together at how we can create a code of conduct, a personalised code of conduct within that tool. Just one second. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. So we're looking here, excuse me. There we go. We're looking here at the um, homepage of the Godan website. So I'll just show you how you can access the tool from the homepage. Um, we go to the tools and resources menu here. And it is under policy guidance and advice. You can see we have the two main tools on the website, open up guide for agriculture and the agricultural data code of conduct side by side. So you can click on the image or on the button to go through to the tool. And the URL you can see there is godan.info forward slash codes. I'll hand over to you, Fatini. Yes, thank you, Kate. Uh, so this tool, as you will see, um, is quite simple and easy to, to use. Uh, first of all, if you click on the um, about uh, section, um, Kate, could you please um, click on that just to show you how it looks, um, the toolkit. I'm ever so sorry, I'm going to have to stop the share. It seems to have paused on my screen. Oh, and reshare my screen. Okay, okay. <laughs> There we go. Perfect. The about section of the Yes, tool. yes. So if you click on that and scroll down, uh, 
you will see uh, what really are uh, codes of conduct, these voluntary um, guidelines, what it is about, um, the scope of the online uh, tool, uh, where it was based, uh, the uh, four existing codes of conduct that we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, what the guidelines uh, are aiming to, to provide to the users, um, as you can see, raise awareness, improve transparency. You, ha you have a first um, glance, a first idea of uh, what this tool is about. And then if you click on the codes section, you have the uh, 17 uh, clauses uh, that we managed to gather based on the review of the existing uh, codes, on the consultation that we had with the different stakeholders. And we uh, concluded with these uh, 17 um, clauses. As mentioned, uh, they are not exhaustive. And let's go, for example, to see what are the definitions, what we are talking about when we say definitions or uh, ability to control. If we click on definitions, then you see uh, the content uh, that it is about what types of data are going to be collected. You can see um, what is considered to be personal data or not. And as you scroll down, as Kate is doing right now, you see that uh, the specific clause is linked with uh, some resources that the user can click on that and have an extra idea to help him, uh, help him or help her understand about the definitions. So you see the US Farm Bureau, uh, the New Zealand Farm Code. There is um, a description what it is about, uh, what are um, the resource link, and to which um, meaning and terms it is linked, uh, consent, data rights, disclosure. So if you are looking this um, information, then uh, you click on these uh, resources. Every single close uh, is linked to these uh, resources, uh, of course, the relevant resources. If we go back again, uh, please, Kate, to demonstrate, for example, to show another close, just to show you uh, the different resources that they're linked. Uh, yeah, you can pick. Yes, okay. yes, perfect. A very good one. The rights of the data originator. Um, here you can see also what it is about, um, which rights are we talking about, and again, the related um, resources. If you scroll down um, to, to see a little bit, yes, um, the review, uh, the GDPR, some articles from the General Data Protection um, Regulation, uh, as you can see, uh, this content helps you understand better. It's not only we have a close, um, we are talking about, let's say, um, the rights of the data originator and that's it. There is a, a description of what it is about and also uh, these extra tools uh, to help you uh, understand and create your own uh, code of conduct. And finally, with these resources, we have in a separate section, uh, they're all gathered. Uh, please, Kate, if you go to the resources. Yes, the final one section. Here are all the relevant um, uh, sections, uh, not sections, um, resources. Uh, they're all together and included. This is what you can find. You can find also a template for uh, consent to have an idea. Um, there are also some guidelines for how to have, for example, make a contract to be uh, more simple. Um, this kind of resources. So once you have seen and you um, just clicked about the about the code and the resources, there comes a time to create your own. That's the idea of this toolkit anyway, correct? Uh, so you click on the My Codes uh, section, and there you can pick 
uh, from the clauses that you consider that they are the most appropriate for you, if you are uh, a farmer, uh, if you are a researcher, uh, you do um, can hierarchy uh, or yeah prioritize uh, the clauses that you would like to be included in this document. So you pick as many as you wish, uh, based as mentioned on your needs, based on your interests, uh, based on the concept that what would you like to be included in these principles when you are um, negotiating, let's say, with an agribusiness, uh, with an active company, uh, and you click, uh, and yes, correct, you add, more and more one or two or uh, three clauses. But when you don't want, for example, to include one clause, you don't find it very relevant, you don't find it very helpful, you have the ability um, to erase it by clicking there. Okay. So once you have selected the clauses that you wish to be included, you go to, I guess, the final format. Can we see that? Have we selected? Just yeah. A yeah, yes, please. Just just <laughs> a little more, a little more to to see the final version of the document, what it's going to to be uh, printed because there is this um, possibility. So we click on the list if we want to see all of those clauses that we've put together. Yes. And then we have the possibility you can see at the top of the screen here, either to print your code or to save and share your code. So that lets you keep a copy of it or maybe share it with somebody else, a contact, maybe someone in your organization who might be interested. And um, so print your code, we click on here, we can give it a name. So we'll just call it code for now. You can be as creative as you like with this. Um, and then we click here to generate a print, print, printable page and it opens up in a new window your code of conduct and as usual you can go to the file and print option in your browser and it comes up with a lovely formatted code of conduct that you can simply print off or print to PDF and store on your computer. Now, if you were wanting to say save and share this code, which you can, we'll just close this window now. There we go. Then you can click on save and share your code. Again, give it a name, we'll call it code again. And then you can generate a savable page, which generates at the same time a unique URL, which you can copy and send to your contacts, Bettini. Thank you, Kate, thank you. So um, as you have seen, and as I have mentioned, I, I believe it's um, a simple tool, uh, quite easy to use. Um, and you can share it uh, as Kate mentioned with um, others for extra, I would say, um, consultation. So this is a, a guide, as we have mentioned, for everyone uh, in the agricultural sector to have a better understanding when we are talking about um, terms and definitions around, let's say, privacy, personal data, farm data, what it is about, the types of data, uh, consent. I would say it's a guide specific, specifically, I would say, for farmers to, to better understand, uh, to have a better idea when they are negotiating via uh, farmers' organizations with uh, agribusinesses about their, uh, their rights, um, basically. And um, it's also from the agribusinesses part, I would say it's good because um, they can take into account uh, others' um, needs and engage in an open uh, di dialogue with the stakeholders and specifically uh, farmers and um, even more specifically smallholder farmers in developing um, countries. And since I've uh, mentioned smallholder farmers uh, and uh, in relation to um, developing countries, this toolkit uh, 
I would say it's the first outcome of, of this consultation, of the workshop that we did, uh, but we do know that we need to work more to have feedback from, um, from you as well. Uh, but as far as it concerns more for the farmers, um, it is interesting that um, we are working um, uh, in, in Uganda uh, with an organization, uh, UTDEV, where Steven Kalizubula uh, is here with us and he's going to explain and say a little bit about the codes of conduct and how could they really um, apply uh, to smallholder farmers um, how could um, help them understand more about the farm data sharing, the benefits around these codes of conduct. So at this point, I would like to invite um, Stephen uh, to, to say some uh, words uh, about that, to be more specific as far as it concerns uh, farmers, uh, basically. Stephen? Hello, yes. Uh... Fortini, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Interesting. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Stefan. I'm in Uganda, and I'm one of the, the founders for UTD Uganda. And uh, we are a group of small, uh, young, energetic, and youths who are looking for level, specifically smallholder farmers. So it's a group of uh, young uh, boys and, uh, and girls, plus women, that are trying to get into this kind of uh, activity. So uh, thank you, uh, the current presenters, for the codes of conduct. It's something that has been interesting. And uh, I remember from the previous workshop we had in Germany, I brought up this kind of idea to the farmers and it's something they appreciated a lot because currently the farmers organizations we have uh, most of them do not have the structures so which means that when cases come in terms of sharing and appreciating the value of the data most of them you find that it's not uh, they don't get the value back after that after they have shared the, the information on the data to whatever partner they have so as you did, uh, Uganda acting as a pilot case, uh, we have a project that uh, we want to start next year. That is basically model digital farming villages. So model, it means that uh, if you join modern digital, you're looking at incorporating the digital aspect in terms of um, promoting the data-driven approach so that the farmers really get to know what value does this data have in the farm? So in this project, uh, we are looking at six months period and we have um, a roadmap that we are going to look at. Um, first, we, 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 we are going to map out the farming villages, okay? We have already identified these are villages which are basically doing the farming and are doing more of organic farming. Most of these smallholder farmers, of course, they have uh, small chunks of land, one acre, two acres, or less than that. So we decided to start with a few because we needed to know what impact does this code of conduct have in their farming organization structure. So that's why we started with mapping out the smallholder farmers. And we are looking at the growers and also the livestock keepers. So, we are looking at uh, central Uganda and we are looking at only two districts uh, in central Uganda. And that's uh, Mukono district and the Wero district because this is one of the one of the recognized districts in terms of farming, especially when it comes to plantations, maize and all those kinds of cereals. In Western Uganda, we are going to look at uh, Mbarara district Barra district is one of the region where we have a lot of banana or what we call the plantations coming out. And from the previous survey we did to understand the challenges these farmers have, it's one of the things that came up. They told us we have a lot of data on our farm. We have collected a lot, but we just find ourselves just sharing, but we don't get the feedback, we don't get the value. So that's why we, we thought that this is the right time we should bring this code of conduct into the activities 
so that we can help this farmers' organization to restructure the activities. So from modeling and identifying these farming villages, the other step we are going to do is to map out the farming, the farmers' organizations in those specific regions. Of course, we are looking at agribusiness, the data driven organizations, the processors themselves, and the circles. So most farmers, of course, they have these circle groups they have. So they do lots of transactions within the groups and outside the groups. So we wanted to, to after we had identified the farming uh, villages, we want to know in those villages, do we have some farming organizations within? And then to how many circles do we have? How many are into processing? How many are growers? How many are livestock keepers? And also we have these high level farming organizations in the country. For example, the Uganda Farming Federation. We have uh, the Igarati. It's one of the top uh, organization in Western Uganda that is dealing in tea growing. So we want to bring these two together so that we bring this code of contact into the Ugandan perspective. In other words, all the main core components that Fahim spoke about, we want to break them down, to translate them to the language they understand. And then we see how do we incorporate this code of conduct into the structures. So when it comes to law policy and data aggregators, under law and policy, we are looking at an organization called Lawyers for Farmers. It's, 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 it's an organization of women, but what they're looking out for is how do we empower, how do they empower the women in the farming sector in terms of them understanding the rights they have, especially on land, and also some of the information they share. So the other organization that we're looking at in this kind of category is the Uganda National Meteorological Authority. This is an organization that has been with us for long, and they've been trying to provide us information on weather forecasts. And now currently they're trying to show us, to provide us means on how to share region specific information. So in the process of course of sharing, they ask us the farmers to send feedback. And in that feedback, of course, you put your growing this in this region, this is the weather and all that. So that's the information you're dishing out. So we want to bring them all together so that we come up with well consolidated code of conduct that applies across so what we shall have in here under code of conduct data stream we want to map out because the entire data stream it's quite big right but we want to sit with these farmers to understand specifically what data do they work with most right if we get that data, then we map out the streams. Where does this data go? And when we get to know these streams, then we know at what level do they have the right to access, to delete, and to share. Because data and information it goes through streams of processes, and along the way, it's subjected to processing. So if it is subjected to processing, which means also the access rights also vary. So that's what we want to do ideally. And in this kind of uh, block, we have the Uganda Data Privacy Bill. This bill is specific to data related to privacy. I mean, phone number, email, are you married and things like that. But it doesn't speak about this kind of other information that government organizations are going on to collect, different projects are coming to collect, and they don't provide equal value back to the farmers. So when we get to this stage and we have this bill already, we are going to balance this together, right? So in this workshop that we intend to have is that once we brainstorm this and we come up with a working framework of code of conduct, of course, incorporating in already what God has, has done, then we shall go out to the three pilot sites, what we call the farmers, the two, the three farmers organization we shall work with to embed what we have agreed on to see how does it move through into that day-to-day -day business. In that process, we want to understand, is it really practical? What impact does it provide? Does it really bring value to the farmers? And when we have that, then we shall plan to scale it further. And once we scale it further, of course, we are looking forward to engage other stakeholders from the government now to see how can they make this as a legal document? Because most farmers in Uganda today, they don't have the voice. 
organizations come, collect the data, they share everything they want, but the value is not equal to what they share. So this is the roadmap that we want to take next year if all goes well. And what we are going to do, we are going to be using the code of conduct that Gordon has uh, provided to guide us in this process. Because a lot of information is outside there and the farmers are confused. And most of the information is probably linked to what they're doing, but we want to consolidate this together so that we get the best out of it. So basically the code of conduct, it does not look at providing rights to the farmers, knowing what right do they have, but also looks at quality and productivity improvement. So that's something small that I wanted to share as uh, an organization that is looking forward to take agriculture on another level and looking at Uganda as a pilot case. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for that very informative presentation. Um, we have some questions now, and since we are now into um, question and answer and discussion time, um, then I hope I can put these to the panel. Um, there's some lovely um, comments. Thank you all for your comments and questions. Um, we've got Felix from Programme for Capacity Development saying, great tool. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, Sonia, very good guide. Thank you, Sonia. Um, and a very interesting question from Beverly Hachambu, um, who is saying, can we talk about how we incorporated smallholder farmers into the consultation and development process of the code of conduct? That would probably be best placed to Fatini, if Fatini would be happy to take that. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I would say that um, Stephen covered um, this question, uh, how uh, smallholder farmers um, can be engaged in the development of these uh, codes of um, conduct. Um, I need, uh, before giving my answer, to mention what Chris uh, um, mentioned, uh, because he had to leave, I think he's not with us um had a, no, he's not okay so um uh cta uh worked under the data for ag project with um many many uh smallholder uh, farmers uh in in africa but not only in in africa and the pacific and they were engaged to these um, consultations. They worked also with the SACAO, with Ismail um, Sunga, with the Pan Africa Farmers Organization. So the the main uh, interest, I would say, uh, from um, Godan, uh, CTA, GFAR as well, and, and the main target. Uh, are the smallholder farmers. And in um, our consultation in 2018, uh, they were also included. Um, also, when we did the workshop uh, at Katibel last year, we had rep representatives uh, from smallholder farmers, from farmers organizations. Um, the consultation uh, here with um, the development of the online tool uh, was also um, addressed to farmers because the focus, as mentioned, uh, is on them. Uh, and like Chris um, mentioned, uh, the farmers should be uh, heard as well. And um, I don't know uh, whether Valeria could add um, something um, extra on, on, on that. Uh, Valeria, I don't know if yeah. I might have missed something to to mention. No, no, absolutely. That those, those were those are the key points. So one small thing that I can add is that uh, the idea is also the idea of having uh, codes of conduct and involving farmers' organizations in the discussions. It, uh, it, the reason, the main reason, is that it's very difficult to involve farmers directly. Of course, smallholder farmers uh, wouldn't probably participate in this. In these meetings, but they wouldn't even. It's it's a way also of relieving them of the burden, learning uh, legal stuff, understanding all the issues. So the farmers' organizations act as intermediaries, uh, and we we thought that they were the best placed uh, stakeholder to to participate in the discussions and uh, work for the farmers and also relieve the farmers from this from the burden uh, burden of uh, learning 
uh, this stuff, which is not the core of what they do. But they, if they trust the farmers' organizations, they trust that the, the codes of conduct uh, negotiated by the farmers' organizations will protect their, their interests. Just to add only something um, that I might have missed uh, mentioning is the fact that um, the existing codes of conduct uh, that the ones that we've mentioned that um, are already in place uh, is that um, they are more uh, in favor and from the perspective of um, bigger businesses or from ag tech companies and less from the farmer's perspective. So um, since we um, reviewed that and seen that, uh, I, I think that it also motivated this as more, uh, Valeria, I would say, to focus more on farmers, to give them a tool uh, that would address their needs, um, to be heard as, as mentioned, uh, to raise awareness of what we are talking about within this contracts to engage them more into the dialogue and that can be uh, can be ha can happen um, basically in, yes not by themselves because there might be the issue of literacy but through and via the farmers organizations like um, very well uh, Stefan um, explained explained earlier uh, we do have a long way ahead of us but still it is a very first good step for involving everyone. This is inclusiveness. And I think in this way, farmers uh, could uh, learn something extra from this uh, toolkit on codes of conduct. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Valeria. Um, we have a question that's come in from Sonia. Are the standards, um, Oh, what um, standards are Godan proposing for use by farmers um, and how will these be cross-referenced? Is there a standards group um, for farmers and data? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if, uh, if Sonia means standards for data sharing or, or standards in terms of legal and uh, let's say ethical uh, I believe it may be data sharing. If it is for data sharing, uh, you know, okay, Putin, you can, uh, Godan is all about that, uh, is uh, mainly about that. And it's also, there's also a lot of work from Godan together with uh, the AIMS group in FAO, and it was also with CPA in the past. <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of capacity development activities on that. I don't know if we, maybe we can share some links later, for instance, on the, on the course that we Develop the mood, the, the MOOC, sorry, the MOOC that CTA, GFAR, no, CTA, FAO, Godan developed on uh, farm data sharing. That's something I covered. It's very difficult to talk about standards for farm data sharing. One thing is in general agricultural data sharing, like governments and other stakeholders, but when it comes to farm data, there is very little, little standardization. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the companies that uh, develop all the software and hardware for uh, precision agriculture, for instance, they follow their own, more or less their own standards, but there are now some initiatives at the inter also at the international level for standardizing data also at the level of machinery and then when it goes through the value chain, but it's still, yeah, it's an interesting topic. We have something uh, in that MOOC and we, we can share the link. Putini, I don't know if you have something just... more. Share the link in the chat for anybody who's interested in looking at the open data course in agriculture. Yeah, um, I don't think that I have something extra to add, uh, Valeria, to be honest. Um, standardization is, uh, is, is a topic, but with this, I would say that with the codes of conduct and specifically this one is to set somehow some common standards. That's, that's the, the idea. Uh, but of course, also, um, there's another issue, I think, yeah, Nikolai uh, did a question, um, asked a question um, about why do we need to have a customizable um, code of conduct? Um, the answer would be uh, because there are different, different needs and uh, different um, interests. Um, earlier, um, 
Chris, uh, when he did his presentation, um, he uh, showed the slide where uh, when we did the Katie Bell workshop uh, last year, we had different uh, representatives. We had researchers, we had farmers, we had uh, representatives from the government. The interesting thing is that each one of these um, groups didn't really select, um, didn't they, um, by hierarchy, the same features. And that uh, tells me something. That perfect. Thank you. Uh, that tells me that the focus of each group is somehow on, on, a, on a different level. They don't really di differentiate a lot, but still um, the, the hierarchy is different. From fa for farmers, we have as the first feature, as the first clause that should be included uh, is the ownership who has access and control over data. Then the definitions, the types of data that we are talking about, um, or the need for farmers to be notified uh, in advance of data collection. And you see the consent, the clear and understandable contract. Um, so this is the farmer's perspective um, from that workshop. And then we have the researchers and the researchers selected that the first feature that should be included in a code of conduct is data uh, clarification, metadata, of course, any researcher I would imagine uh, would like to have metadata and source de description. Um, verification of legal and contractual obligations between the provider and processor the type and sensitivity of the data, risk assessment, you do see that it is a little bit different or quite different, I would say, from the farmer's perspective. And that's the beauty of the, 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 the I would say, the, the, the workshop and uh, furthermore, uh, the consultation, because you see the different perspectives and different needs and the difficulty of all this to, to combine and standardize it somehow. And the government, so what about the governments? Uh, develop simple and understandable contracts. Yes, first of all. Then ownership, um, collection, access, control, and consent. Um, after we have rights of the data originator, the content termination, the participatory certification, that it's very, very important. But as you see and you realize, uh, the features are the same, the, the hierarchy is different. So if you ask me, we do have the need first of all, to, to have a customizable code of contact, because as mentioned, we, we, we don't have the same needs. Uh, we have, um, as mentioned in the data value chain, different stakeholders, and hence we need to target on, on their um, interests. But still, if you see the topics that are around data, farm data sharing are pretty much the same. How, so we need to better organize and better understand what we are talking about. And this is the first attempt with this uh, online toolkit on codes of contact. And first, uh, as I um, said, we need to focus on, on a more customizable um, code of conduct. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions that you would like to um, for us to answer. I don't know, Kate. Do we have some time? We have some. Oh, Chris, you're back here. <laughs> Abiodun is mentioning um, that he is concerned that smallholder farmers are considered um, in this and in the codes. I think that this was part of the conceptualization of the codes in the first place. Bettini, maybe you could just go over that again quickly. Uh, you mean uh, to, to um, include farmers as well to the discussions of the development of this toolkit? Absolutely. Yes, um, as I mentioned, um, there were many consultations around this uh, topic with uh, smallholder uh, farmers and uh, we wanted to include them because as Valeria mentioned also earlier, it's quite difficult for farmers to participate to these uh, discussions, but the, the vision, I would say, of Godan City and GFAR was exactly that, uh, not only to to just refer to, to farmers, uh, but also to include them uh, into these uh, discussions. So we 
did have these um, consultations with them, with different uh, organizations. The one that I mentioned that Chris uh, uh, mentioned as well, SACAO, Pan-African Farmers Organization. Um, I don't know, Chris, if there are some um, UTDEV, CDTO uh, from Zimbabwe, uh, Farmers Organization. Uh, please, uh, Chris, if you have yeah, any well, more uh, organizations to mention, please. Well, I think I think Stephen's in the best position to talk about the deep dive we did talking face to face. Um, but I just pop in the fact that we work with a number of different uh, associations, farmers groups uh, across Africa on a related project, Data for Ag. And uh, there we had sort of representative groups ranging from CAPAD in Burundi uh, with uh, 30 um, cooperatives that they were working with on growing um, sort of maize and uh, rice and other uh, other uh, crops through to coffee and and um, uh, uh, also tea and in the case of uh, coffee it was particularly at the right time because they were talking about farmer registration and so that we did a lot of work on the ground in that particular project coming up with the agreement between the farmers and the enumerators for both coffee and tea in order to collect the farmer profiles. And the same was true with CAPAD to a different extent. But this was so fundamental to being able to act as an aggregate, um, this whole agreement and how to explain it to the farmers was a huge part of those projects. So the communication element of explaining what was going to be done with the data resulted in these kind of agreements, but more to the point, it, it resulted in some degree of informed consent because the farmers understood the benefits. But Stephen, you you really had some experience face to face in your workshops. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Chris, for for, for, for that uh, addition. Now, in line with the codes of conduct, you know, it's it's because of the farmers why this code of conduct is coming up. It's it's because of the complaints, the the, the statements that have been saying out that. We want to know what value does it come? What value do we get as a result of sharing? And this is the rationale as to why the code of conduct was instituted. But now from the feedback with the farmers organization, because I remember I was in the group of the farmers organization. In fact, it was the biggest group out of the rest. And the biggest argument was basically on the value they get. What value do they get as a result of sharing the data? And in one of the discussions I remember with one of the innovators, I think uh, they had an innovation related to cryptocurrency, but working with farmers. And they said, when we have the farmers on our app, when they share the data, they get credit for that. That is something interesting. They see the value coming up because they keep on using the app because at the end of the day, they are seeing the products outside the people looking for them, people contacting them. And now you see that data is protected. They even send them alerts that, you know what, on this day, we want to update your information. And they subscribe to it, like they just agree to it because it's very transparent. So in the Ugandan setting concerning the code of conduct, this is something new. Even though a few farmers that we have spoke to, that we have worked to, it's something they want to work with it's something they want to know what impact does it have in the activities so it's something that we have seen that majority want to take on even the fact that you even add value to their structure i remember when we were doing a feasibility study in western uganda that is on the banana plantations and one of the farmer in the southern organization told us that come on we have done various assessments various organizations have come and done assessments on my farm but I've never received any feedback. Projects come, they collect the data, they give everything they need, they share the information, but they don't see the value back in their farm. So that has made them lose the morale and the interest in all these, the apps you see, the innovations they bring, the digital cards you see, because they don't see the value coming back to them. So this code of conduct, to me, I think it's going to strengthen the farmers' organization structures is going to add value to already the existing structures they have. That's what I can say, Chris, on this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, everybody.
Um, there are quite a lot of interesting questions here. Um, I'll pick this one from John. The toolkit looks very good. Thank you very much, John. He's wondering if there are any perspectives on paying farmers directly for data and how this would fit into the code of conduct. I can see Chris, you're nodding. Would you like to start perhaps? Yeah, there, there've been quite some uh, discussions uh, around this. And I know, um, for example, that the Blue Number Initiative was looking into this. Uh, Blue Number is a kind of a certification scheme for farmers um, uh, fitting the uh, SDG goals, so showing their contribution individually at farm level. And um, in that case, uh, they're looking at the, the value of the data. One of the issues is, of course, that the, the data really only becomes valuable once aggregated. So the actual amounts involved can be really quite small micropayments. Now, that's not to say it's not worthwhile, but it really depends on commodities. What we found, for example, is okay in the cash crops like cocoa, coffee, tea, where things like certification and digitalization as a whole, collecting data can add the profitability to the farmer by 30%. The kind of gains for the farmer are much bigger from the change in having a digital management system of these commodities than they are for an actual payment of the data, which as an individual data point is not really of negligible value but compared to the kind of benefits they can get. And, and this was even true with a group like CAPAD where they were looking at um, really getting collective advantage from buying inputs together and being able to sell together as a result of having a membership system where their data was held together and profiling, um, that benefit was much more. So the only proviso I'd say on the data earning is, yes, it happens with some of the larger concerns and uh, larger scale farming, but for the smallholder, as a proportion of the benefit, it's still um, a small amount. But that doesn't mean that the farmer shouldn't be involved in how that data is used and have a voice in what's said. Rather than focusing on the monetary value, look at the other benefits and look at the control and access to the data. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we have a question here as well from Robert Sisson, who is saying, um, have we seen any legislature um, or laws supporting Godan Ag Data Sharing Guidelines? And are any legislators that we're aware of literate in Ag Data issues? This would probably be one for Fatini, if you have any insight. Uh, yeah, well, um, the most relevant uh, is the, um, an EU regulation about the free flow of non-personal data, uh, where it is stated there that um, data coming from um, precision agriculture is considered non-personal data. And also this regulation really, um, how can I say, um, encourages the, the development of um, codes of conduct. So it is very, very um, close to what we are uh, doing with this and we have developed with this uh, toolkit on codes of conduct. Um, this is the most close to um, uh, agriculture uh, legislation, I would say, the EU regulation of non, uh, free flow of non-personal data. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe this should be the last question, but it is quite interesting. So I might just try and shoehorn that in there before we close. Um, Caroline Kern has said, um, do we see a need for data literacy in small smallholder farming community? And would that be something of value for them in this context? I don't know who would like to lead on that. Maybe this is something for Stephen that Stephen might like to weigh in on. Uh, Kathy, I missed the question. Can you hold me repeat it, please? Okay, no worries at all. So Caroline is asking, do we see a need for data literacy in smallholder farming communities? Would it be something of value for them in this context? Yes, so when you're speaking about uh, smallholder farmers, 
if I'm to speak from the context uh, in Uganda, smallholder farmers, these are, uh, I can't say they're village farmers, okay? 60% uh, illiterate majority, but these are the people who own big chunks of land or small chunks of land. And most of the activities are done with, um, I can say the old ways of doing things. And uh, to this, there's something I saw of recent when we visited a certain farmer and we were trying to discuss about data, what it means and it looks like it's magic. Like you're speaking things that do not exist. But he told me one thing that I've seen the apps, most of them, the Play Store and all this, but I've never seen the value they bring to me. Like he just logs on, they puts all the information he wants to put and he doesn't see, you know, that kind of value coming back to him. So he decided to put all the records in the book. So he keeps everything in the book and he's comfortable with it. So it's something that we need to really address with a lot of vigilance and passion. It's something that looks like complex, but we need to package it to fit into the understanding of the farmers. And that's why when you look at the codes of conduct, our roadmap, we want to twist this code of conduct to fit in the language that the farmers understand. The guideline that uh, Fortini has been presenting, the codes of conduct that are designed, it's a very good document for reference because not everything there that when you just put it on the table for the farmer, he's not going to understand them. So we just need to work with them to pick out a few points, discuss with them and try to get their feelings and try to see what do they really want that is going to be implemented in their structures. And that's what I can say. Literate, literate levels are really there. Most of the farmers are literate, but I've seen there is already hope with the hope of this code of conduct, yes. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I think we should probably move on to talking about next steps now. Um, I think, Bettini, maybe you have some ideas. Well, following the, the discussion and basically uh, the last question and uh, answer from um, Stephen, I would say uh, to continue um, working more uh, with farmers, educating, educating um, farmers, um, and basically this can be done uh, via uh, farmers' organizations. Also, um, Gordon has the um, Gordon uh, Open uh, Data Champions uh, that they um, work on these relevant issues that they can um, educate um, farmers, youth, uh, women um, around their rights, around the, the needs um, that they, uh, they have to uh, inform them. That's the idea. And that's the idea, for example, of this online tool to educate as much as possible to raise um, uh, awareness and specifically for, for farmers because um, I've seen somewhere else um, earlier um, a question or a comment that um, this review with this existing codes of conduct uh, didn't really include um, agribusinesses. I'm doing a parenthesis right now. And I've, I've mentioned that earlier that um, doing the review, while we, we did the review, we've noticed that the existing codes of conduct were coming from the stronger one, the stronger actors, uh, the agribusinesses and the ag tech companies. Um, hence, our work was more on um, uh, empowering more um, farmers. Um, that was the idea. That is still the the idea uh, to focus more on on farmers. Um, other than that, the how can we move forward? Uh, this um, virtual workshop has that rationale to um, make this toolkit um, 
more, how can I say, it, um, broad, broader to the agricultural audience to know more about it, to work with this tool, to see whether it is helpful, um, where are the, um, what are the strengths, what are the the opportunities given when someone is working with this tool, but also to see um, what else and what more uh, needs to be done. Uh, for example, um, probably you might have missed some uh, clauses, extra clauses to be included. Um, that's why we are asking for the participants uh, uh, their feedback. Uh, it's an involving uh, process. Um, so um, right now, I would like to open the floor to the participants to just um, give their feedback if they would like, um, based on the discussion that we did already, based on the demonstration of the online tool, um, what would they like to be um, included or skip out? It would be a question, what is missing? We posted five questions, if you have noticed in the, the chat box during the, the workshop. Uh, and these questions had the, the, the concept of providing um, of, of having feedback from the participants. Uh, so I think now would be a good time um, from many of you uh, to um, just give us um, your thoughts, your, um, your ideas, how could we move uh, forward I would just would just, sorry I would like just to highlight uh, one good way of working forward is the pilot case for example with Uganda uh, the one that Stephen um, mentioned what UTDEV is doing this is a very very good um, example of moving uh, forward to better communicate uh, this online tool and what it does uh, through farmers organizations this is one um, um, one idea uh, that I could right now um, uh, mention and open up dialogue uh, also with the different stakeholders uh, to have um, their their thoughts as well, uh, researchers uh, or the government. Yes, here are the questions, um, as you can see. Um, what is missing, the features that we might have uh, not taken into account. Um, what principles also should be considered besides trust, fairness, inclusion, equity, transparency or integrity, accountability could be, justice could be, I'm just mentioning a few. Um, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of the codes of conduct? We've mentioned some of, um, of them strengths and weaknesses, but as mentioned, we're more than welcome to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Um, and also another question, an important question, who should be responsible for developing, adopting or implementing these codes of conduct? Um, the data users, the companies, governments, the data originators, it's, it's a big question if you ask me. And of course, finally, but not least, uh, certification schemes, uh, how can we establish an independent um, authority? Because we do know that um, these codes of conduct are um, self-regulatory, uh, they're not legally binding, uh, but um, the existing ones, the majority of them uh, have uh, certification schemes that uh, make make them more um, trustworthy if there is uh, an independent authority to do so. So these are the questions. Uh, please feel free to um, answer in any of these uh, questions. Maybe for the, if nobody in the audience is. Uh... For the moment saying anything one very quick thing on point four uh, who should be responsible for, for developing adopting uh, and implementing uh, i think it's a quick key question because one thing is uh, having a toolkit that, that allows you to understand choose the clauses etc but it's, even if you come up with a very nice code of conduct that you like uh, uh, until it gets adopted uh, promoted and is validated, is validated by the stakeholders, of course, it's useless because the code of, code of conduct is as good as, uh, I mean, the, the, the adoption that it gets. And if you cannot count on the counterpart where, with, with whom you have a contract on adhering to that code of conduct, of course, uh, it's not useful. So I think
think yeah, the way you adopt it, the way you promote it and get others to accept it is really essential. And part of the work that will have to be done is on that. I totally agree with you, uh, Valeria, 100%. You will see um, posted links to the GoDan Data Rights group in the chat section. If you would like to follow up on this work to get more involved, and then please do join the Data Rights Working Group mailing list and you can carry on the discussion after this workshop. Sorry, Stephen, I can see you were about to talk. I was saying, did you ask the, 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 the participants to, to comment or say something? Yes, Stephen, uh, we would like uh, from the participants their thoughts and idea, if it's possible. Um, Interesting. Let me also share that with the rest. I think it's basically what Valeria mentioned to have this um, broader adoption of this um, in general of the codes of conduct. That's that that's the concept and that's the the, the importance actually of um, this codes of conduct, the adoption, the implementation as well. Maybe maybe it's difficult for the participants to give feedback right now. Uh, I I totally send feedback by email. <laughs> I, I totally understand it. I totally understand it uh, myself. Uh, it's not an easy task to do so. Mm. Uh, we've been working on this, uh, as you both of you know, Valeria and Chris and uh, Stephen as well. Uh, you know, in two years now, uh, within two years, we have these discussions. It's it's not an easy it's not an easy task to do to do so. Um, the good thing is, I would say, uh, from my experience, is that more and more discussions are about um, data ethics, uh, the need for um, uh, soft law policies. Um, so I would say that it's, it is quite um, encouraging uh, because we can't really uh, overlook these um, issues. We do know uh, that uh, what technology can offer, we do know that. Uh, uh, Chris mentioned that as well. Uh, Valeria, you mentioned that as well uh, during uh, your uh, presentations. Uh, but we do need to, to, to balance as well the ethical and legal aspects uh, when it comes with um, a technology and how can we um, empower and educate, educate smallholder uh, farmers basically. Um, so as I have already mentioned, this is one tool uh, we need to work more towards that direction. Um, and of course, like Kate uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we do have this um, data rights and responsible data working group where we are working on these topics. And we do have this sub group on codes of conduct where we could continue our discussions and our thoughts uh, following um, this, um, this workshop. So it's a good starting point for um, broadening the, 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 the discussion um, uh, furthermore, um, to everyone who is interested uh, in these discussions. And I've seen very, very interesting, um, how can I say, initiatives and work that they're relevant with our work. So feel free to join to our uh, working group. If we think it would be useful, we can send out a Google questionnaire next week um, in order to get more feedback from the participants, as long as all participants are happy with that, feel free to ignore, but it would be really useful to us to get your feedback on the tool and how we can improve it going forward. That's excellent. Excellent suggestion, Kate. Okay, well, if there are no more comments from our panel, 